of that and acute care and tied together with it. So we have a significant clinical partnership with them, always have, and look forward to this, Jody. Thank you. Great. Thank you, sir. Good morning. I'm Jody Miller. I'm one of the neurosurgeons here. I see some kind of fresh, young faces in the crowd that did not see last year. So I'd like to make this as interactive as possible, so please stop, ask questions. And the real kind of goal, like Dr. Burns said, is collaborative care. It's collaborative care between neurosurgery, trauma, vascular surgery, and all the other surgery subspecialties. And that's what I tried to kind of center this talk around. But first things first, last year we talked about how not to become this guy, Dr. Death. And this year we need some more positive role models. So I came up with these sayings in the operating room. And most of them were uh, pawned off, stolen um, from other people, some of which are in this room. And I didn't realize that young, impressionable minds have been writing them down every case. So Dr. Uh, Katsura, one of the orthopedic residents, did over 100 cases with me. He would write down these little sayings. And the first one was, trust no one and expect sabotage. And that actually came from a pediatric general surgeon, my first lecture in med school. I told this story last year. And it's kind of a segue into talking about traumatic injuries to the arterial system, carotid vertebral arteries. And so there are so many patients that come through our trauma service and through the trauma bay to get a CT angiogram of the head and neck. And each one of those images has 380 slices, 270 slices, and so it's, it's a lot. It's a lot to look at. And sometimes these injuries are missed, and sometimes even though we see them, we treat them and patients can have strokes. So it, it's a difficult disease entity to wrap its mind around, wrap our mind around. So I thought we'd take a little bit of time this morning talking about blunt traumatic extracranial cerebrovascular injuries and ischemic stroke. So these are your traumatic dissections, aneurysms, transections of the carotid and vertebral arteries that can ultimately result in strokes. So about 2% of all blunt traumas will have some type of cerebrovascular injury. 10% uh, of these patients will end up having a stroke. And about 20% of our blunt traumas are at risk. And so one thing we always talk about is that, you know, are we appropriately utilizing different imaging modalities in the ER? We talk a lot about should we get CT scans on every patient? Should we get CT angiograms on every patient? What about MRIs? with cervical spine injuries, thoracic spine injuries, and it, it's a reasonable question. And there's guidelines that kind of guide us in terms of which patients we need to obtain CT angiograms on. But if you think about it kind of like a bigger picture of like, okay, what other patient populations can have vertebral artery dissections? You can have very low energy injuries that can cause vertebral artery dissections. I've seen patients sneezing, pneumonia, coughing, I've seen patients with chiropractic manipulation. And so these non-traumatic vertebral artery dissections are not terribly uncommon. We see several cases uh, a quarter that have come into our office with neck pain. They had a chiropractic manipulation. You send them for a CT angiogram, they have a vertebral artery dissection. It may be a grade one, but they still had an injury to that vessel. So if a patient who is in, going to the chiropractor can get a vert dissection, Surely one of our high-speed motor vehicle collision or motorcycle accidents, fall from height can have a traumatic vertebral artery injury. And so that's why you see this kind of ballooning of obtaining these CT angiograms of the head and neck because it, it's, a, it's a common problem in a, a massive number of, of people. And so when you find these, what do you do about it? How do you characterize them? So in medicine, we come up with a bunch of scales, and the scales aren't really necessarily just to help us describe, but also help to kind of guide treatment. So this is the Biffle scale. So the first, like number one, it, like any scale generally, it is the least amount of injury. So it's less than 25% narrowing of the vessel. There can be a dissection, small amount of thrombus. And the literature says these generally get better. So these are typically the patients who've had some type of chiropractic manipulation, low speed impact, aspirin. Most of these patients will improve. Uh, the grade twos are the ones that we typically see after our high energy traumas that have a more significant injury to the vessel. 
And these need some type of antithrombotic treatment. Grade threes are the aneurysms. These are traumatic aneurysms. Uh, you more commonly see these uh, in the carotid than in the vertebral system just because of the supporting bony anatomy of the transverse foramen. I think it decreased the instance rate of patients with uh, traumatic aneurysms, um, but you, do, you can see them in the vertebral artery system as well. And then kind of on the opposite side of things, the complete occlusion is more common with vertebral artery injuries, they're traumatic, than carotid injuries. And then the tr transections, those are the fatal carotid injuries that uh, we see a time or two every year. So this is, this is like the big debate. This is kind of getting us to the second law of Miller is that you never know the right decision until you made the wrong one. And so centers are split. So there's a big study that looked at preferences for treating vertebral artery injuries with antithrombotic care, whether this is anticoagulation or antiplatelets or both. So about 17% of centers do both. And so let's look at the anticoagulation side, which was the tendency of our institution, and still is, is to treat these patients with anticoagulation. So that is uh, a larger percentage of centers. Uh, there's a slightly higher rate of hemorrhagic complication uh, with heparin and then transitioning into Coumadin. Uh, antiplatelets uh, at UAB, that's where I trained, that was the, the treatment of choice because of the lower rate of hemorrhagic um, complications. And it, it, it makes, both of them make sense, but if you think about an arterial injury just in general, like if you think about a cardiac stent or an endocranial stent, these patients are typically treated with dual antiplatelet therapy just because the arterial wall is a platelet-rich environment and that's felt to decrease the rate. The problem is that there's no big randomized controlled trial to compare the three options of antithrombotic treatment, anticoagulation, antiplatelet, or both. And so we have to kind of pick and choose which studies we look at and it is um, a toss-up. Last time I reviewed the literature, and I reviewed it again last night, it is um, a hard decision, and oftentimes these patients will have strokes. So this is a patient that we had on our service, the first um, image I showed where she had bilateral vertebral artery occlusions. And the stroke rate of this is about 50%, and the consequences can be severe. And the problem with occlusions is there's no great treatment. You can't navigate an occluded vessel, especially if there is a spinal injury that is pinching that nerve. So if they have a listhesis or a fracture through the transverse foramen, the best treatment, and there's a paper that came out of uh, UAB, was the best treatment for bilateral vertebral artery occlusions is early surgical intervention to reduce the cervical fracture. So let's kind of look back at um, radiology. And so we did this last year. This is great for people who have not seen that many spine CTs, interns, people who are about to come on trauma for the first time. And really, spine imaging, it's pretty straightforward. I mean, the key with spine imaging, just like any other type of imaging, is to have a systematic way at looking at your scans. So I always start in the same place. I start with defining what's most important. And the most important thing in the spinal canal is the spinal cord, which runs in the spinal canal. And the limits of the spinal canal are made up by the posterior vertebral body line and the inner laminar line. And typically, if these two lines are intact, you haven't had a significant disruption to the disc, facet complex, and ligaments. And then after this, I go over and look at the facet joints. So I look and make sure that the facet joints are shingled like the shingles on a roof. And here you can see that there's been an injury to this facet capsule that's called some splaying of that joint. So these, these injuries can be subtle and they can be unstable. The, the next thing I do is I, I then go and scroll on the axials. So I always start on the sagittals and I look at the axials. I look at the lateral masses here now look at the connection between the posterior elements, which is the lamina, spinous process, lamina, and the anteriorly placed vertebral bodies. These are the transverse foramen where the vertebral arteries are located. And I look at this connection. This is the pedicle. So you can see there's a pedicle fracture here. And then I look at the connection between the lateral mass and the lamina, which you can see there's a, a laminar fracture 
on the patient's right. And so this type of fracture is called a pillar fracture. And the articular pillar, and the reason I showed this image, is important. It's an important structural element in the cervical spine because it, it provides the majority of support. And so pillar fractures are, by definition, unstable fractures. And then I look at the coronals. Uh, the coronal images are only helpful at the craniocervical junction. So I would not spend much time looking below C2 at the coronals. They're not helpful. But it's very, it, it's very helpful for looking at the occipital condyles, the lateral mass of C1, the odontoid. So anyone I get consulted on for an odontoid fracture, I pay special attention to the coronal imaging. I, most odontoid fractures are type 2s that are right across the neck of the odontoid. You occasionally see type 3s. The type 3s are, 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 are never perfectly positioned, like in the textbook, through the vertebral body. They're oftentimes oblique. They can be in any configuration. So that's why you'll rarely see us describe an either type 1 or type 3 odontoid fracture. The next thing is going to taking those same principles from the cervical spine and applying them to the thoracic and lumbar spine. So again, the most important thing, especially for neurosurgeons, the Orthopedists in the room may uh, say otherwise, but the most important thing is what's in the spinal canal. It's not the bones, it's the spinal cord. And so again, we define the posterior vertebral body line, we define the inner laminar line, and we look and make sure that there's no bony fragments pushing on the spinal cord. Again, we look at the axials next, look at the pedicles, the transverse processes, and the spinous process. So by far and away, the most common non-operative fractures that we all see are transverse process fractures and spinous process fractures. And so these fractures hurt. They are very painful. And the reason they hurt is because there's big muscles that attach to them. And every time the patient moves, it's kind of like a rib fracture. They have significant pain. And at first, I would kind of roll my eyes at these fractures, especially if they had like three or four of them, the patient's, you know, just wailing in pain. But then I realized after seeing like several thousand people with these, that it is incredibly painful. And it, they almost always get better when they come back to see me in my office by four weeks. And that's why I try not to see them sooner. You have to give them time to heal. And this is the most commonly used classification system for thoracolumbar fractures. And it, it's helpful not to memorize, but it, it, it's helpful just to kind of think about conceptually. And, and that's true with pretty much anything in neurosurgery is that there's all these grading systems and people love naming things after themselves and they love assigning numbers and you gotta tally them up and then you gotta figure out, okay, does this meet criteria? But if you just think about what this scale is actually saying, it makes a lot of sense. And this is true in the cervical spine and this is true in the thoracic and lumbar spine. And so the first thing is what kind of fracture is it? Is it a mild fracture or is it a bad fracture? And bad fractures where they're dislocated, they have spinal optosis, they've broken their facet joints, bad fractures typically need surgery. Same thing with neurologic involvement. If they're intact, that's good. That means that they may not need surgery. If they're not intact, that's bad. That, may, that means that they probably do need some type of intervention. And the same thing with the integrity of their ligamentous complex. So if they've disrupted their ligaments, they have a bad fracture, and they have a neurological injury, you don't need a grading system to tell you that that patient needs surgery. And that's what can be confusing about looking at spine imaging and looking at neurosurgery is that there's all these different grading systems, scales, characterizations of fractures. But if you just think about the big picture when you're out in practice, when you're here in, in our ER, it helps you kind of wrap your mind around, hey, when I'm calling the spine surgeon or when I'm looking and evaluating these films, is this going to need surgery? And that's pretty helpful to uh, helpful way to look at it. So now to the brain. So the brain is another thing that it seems like it would be really complicated. Like we're all intimidated by neuroanatomy. There are a gazillion different things that we all learned, and probably the best neuroanatomist that uh, that I've been around in many years is sitting in the room, Dr. Maxwell. He and I did the the uh, brain slices at the trauma symposium, and I, I could not have been more impressed of his knowledge of the frame and the cranial nerves and different anatomic structures. I wouldn't expect you all to have that depth of knowledge that Dr. Maxwell possesses. Um, so let's think about just the brain big picture, just kind of simplistically. It is a rigid vault with a hole in the bottom of it, and this hole in the bottom of it is trying to kill our patients. It's trying to kill the trauma patient. And so what happens, 
is that the brain, it is a protector, but it's not the smoothest protector. It's very jagged. It can cause contusions of the brain, and it's rigid. It doesn't give much room for swelling. And the reason why it swells is it's made mostly of water. And so the brain is about 73% water. And so if you kind of uh, can imagine filling the skull with three quarters water, there's not much structural support. And also when something in the body gets injured, it swells. It accumulates more water and that's what causes it to herniate down through the frame and magnum. And so the first thing I look at is the frame and magnum to see if I can see CSF at the frame and magnum. And then the next thing I do is I look at the cisterns. I look at where the uncus is here and I make sure that I can see water here and around the brain stem and you don't have to learn the names of the ambient cistern, the quadrigeminal cistern, and all these cisterns. Just know that after looking at hundreds and hundreds of CTs, that there are cisterns and water-filled uh, water spaces toward the base of the brain that are incredibly important. And when they become obstructed, they can, that can result in herniation and that can result in injury. The next thing I do is I come up and I look at the lateral ventricles, which are these fluid-filled spaces, kind of looks like a butterfly here. I look at those to see if they're dilated or if they're completely compressed, like you see in someone with a you know, horrible traumatic brain injury and diffuse axonal injuries. So I thought that this would be a, a good time to detour from the talk from last year and talk a little bit about football. So this is one of our board members' grandson. Bo Nix, and uh, football is, you know, America's pastime, and my kids started flag football for the first time. A bunch of us had kids in the room, and I've already received, like, several emails from parents about, like, soft helmets for flag football. I've received, like, numerous phone calls about, hey, should my kid play tackle football, and as healthcare providers in the kind of modern era of football, with this consciousness for concussion. I thought this would be a, a good topic because it not only helps us wrap our mind around football-related injuries and concussions and making decisions for our own kids, but it also kind of helps us like understand our mild traumatic brain injuries. And so a traumatic brain injury is really any external insult to the brain that could possibly impair function and consciousness. And so one thing that I, I'm not a fan of is like I had a father send me this long email two nights ago that he's, you know, he's just had concussions, but he's had three of them and he's seven years old. And so I, I'm not a huge fan of blowing off concussions as just a concussion. It, you know, it's a mild traumatic brain injury that can lead to persi persistent symptoms, which a lot of these children have. So let's look back at the history of football. It's kind of interesting. So I love the like descriptions of these old newspapers. So the 1894 Harvard versus Yale game was the bloodbath at Hamden Park. The two, uh, 1905 season was named the Death Harvest because there were so many deaths. And it wasn't until Roosevelt got involved with some rule changes that he started to make football safer. And this was after his son was injured playing uh, for Harvard. He had a, a frontal fracture. And it has always been a, a dangerous game that we've attempted to make safer. So the first thing we tried to do in the 50s is with certain polymers came out, we were able to make hard helmets. And what that did is it decreased the mortality rate from epidural hematomas and subdural hematomas. So the original helmet, and you can see by these linear impact tests, all it was designed to do was designed to decrease the mechanical forces from a direct blow. So it was meant to prevent a skull fracture. It was not meant to prevent the rotational injuries that you see in concussions. And that's what modern helmets have really, are really aiming to limit. And so speaking of modern helmets, there was some controversy over uh, this gentleman's helmet. And it gets me to the fourth law of Miller, the, uh, the enemy of great is good, which is multiple different ways to look at that, uh, especially when you're thinking about him. All right, so the modern football helmet, and this is the helmet that he picked before he was uh, kicked out of the league. Um, the, uh, the modern helmet, it's really interesting. It's designed to prevent and limit the amount of rotational impact. So most helmets are pretty good at decreasing the chance of fracturing your skull. But these helmets, and there's multiple different varieties. There's this vicious helmet, um, which has a cool name, and I think that's probably why they won a big DOD grant. 
And then also the MIPS, which we're probably most familiar with. It's most of our cycling helmets that we put on our families that we wear ourselves. You know, my, my and my daughter's uh, ski helmets are both MIPS. But they all kind of aim to do the same thing. They aim to kind of shift on top of your head to absorb some of that rotational impact. And whether or not that's effective long-term in decreasing concussions is, is yet to be seen. But it, it's, a, it's a way that football and manufacturers are trying to limit these rotational injuries to uh, prevent concussions. And even though these numbers seem relatively high, and CNN always can make things look very dramatic, if you think about having you know, 11 deaths out of 13 million participants, it's still a relatively safe game in terms of mortality. But what's the safety in terms of concussion and long-term cognitive impact? And that's a hard thing to answer. All right, so kind of back on track. So the CT scans are done, and we examine the patient. We've got no response. You know, what do we do? So what can we do? So there's a couple options. Um, one's medical and one's surgical. So the medical treatment is what's typically initiated immediately in the emergency department. That's securing the patient's airway, decreasing their CO2. Oftentimes they're started on mannitol, 3% to decrease the amount of water and the amount of pressure in the head. And then in terms of surgical treatment, we can also, we can remove blood clots and we can alleviate pressure. Unfortunately, we can't like rebuild or regrow the damaged brain, but we have to prevent further injury um, at the time they uh, enter the emergency department. So trepanation or decompressive craniectomies has been around, you know, like I said, last year for thousands of years. I mean, their skull's 12,000 years old, and the archaeological record even suggests that a lot of these patients survive some of these procedures. And we can do the same thing. I mean, it's, it's a rigid container, and so if there's a problem in a rigid container, you can make the rigid container bigger. And that's what a decompressive craniectomy is. Um, one thing about these rigid containers is that if you make a small hole, it typically has a small effect. And that's one thing that we really aim to do on our decompressive craniectomies is to make them very big. And so oftentimes it's like the enemy of gray is good. If you think you're doing just a good enough job making just big enough hole, if you don't objectively measure that, then you oftentimes will make a craniectomy defect that's too small. That's very true in the posterior fossa. It's less true on the convexity because it's easier to get to. And so one important thing is to try to make your craniectomy defect as large as possible to give the patient their greatest chance of surviving this. The other thing is draining these fluid-filled spaces. And the way to drain these fluid-filled spaces, and the reason I like to go over this, is because you all put in bolts. And bolts are, are and can be safe procedures. They can also be morbid procedures. But the key to doing a bolt safely is not necessarily making sure that you know all the steps the very first time you do it, which is important, you kind of learn as you go. But the most important thing is to start your hole in the correct position. So the key is you do not want to put a hole in the midline because there's this huge vein that runs down the center of the brain. And you do not want to put your hole too far posterior. So the key is to make sure that the hole is about at the mid pupillary line, which will get you far enough off of midline to avoid the sinus. And then you want to make sure that your hole is in front of the coronal suture. And I always feel the coronal suture. You can feel it on every single patient, unless they have a very thick scalp. And the reason why to put it in front of the coronal suture is that if you go behind the coronal suture, if you go four centimeters behind the coronal suture, so if you go right here, that's where the motor strip is. And so if you put a bolt in the motor strip and then you have a hemorrhage, they will be weak. They will have left-sided weakness. And so that's why these bolts are typically safe, is that even though they can often have small hemorrhages, if you put them frontal enough, even if they have a hemorrhage, they will not cause a significant problem. They will rarely cause an injury that requires surgical evacuation. And the typical steps to putting in a bolt are you incise the skin at your landmark, you then strip away the periosteum, with a uh, pair of pickups or um, a forcep, and you then use a drill, it's a hand drill, and you drill through the skull. 
And the reason why to strip away the periostom is it can grab that drill bit. And so you want to drill, and when you drill, if you, if you kind of play around with the drills, um, there's, uh, there's always one laying around that gets thrown off. If you play around with a drill, if you're drilling on a ball, it's very hard to drill orthogonally on a ball. You'll notice that the drill bit just kind of skirts off at various angles. The, the key is to be perfectly perpendicular to the skull, and then you just go slowly. You go slowly until you feel it breach the inner cortical layer of bone, and then you open the dura and you insert the, uh, insert the bolt. So the kind of summarizing principle of care for traumatic brain injuries is water. And so if you think about these concepts as kind of big picture concepts is, okay, if my patient has high pressure, if they have low perfusion pressures, and they have high pressure in the head, low perfusion pressures, they're not getting enough blood flow to the brain. So high intracranial pressure is bad. Low systemic blood pressure is also bad because we want to boost our cerebral perfusion pressures. And so that's the key kind of guiding concept toward our neurocritical care is trying to increase the success of brain for perfusion by limiting endocranial pressure and maximizing mean arterial pressure. But really the key concept of trauma is prevention. And that's why it was so cool. Uh, Chris Bell um, introduced me to the Chattanooga Area Brain Injury Association. And it was, it was pretty phenomenal experience for me um, because even though I've been in practice for three years here in Chattanooga and I've taken care of hundreds of patients with you all in the room, I always kind of wonder, like, what happened to these people? Like, what happens to people after a brain injury or spine injury after we get them to Siskin or to Kindred? And, and we get these little windows and these glimpses into their lives. And, um, but it's for a short wound check. It's to make sure that their incisions look good, make sure they don't need any other surgery, and we sign off. And so what I kind of took away from giving this talk at the Chattanooga Area Brain Injury Association, there was a lot of our patients were there, and many of them came up to me afterwards and had some just fascinating conversations, is that really the best way is to get involved with an, an organization like that and work toward prevention, um, because prevention is really the best thing. And so it is things that, you know, we all maybe don't do the greatest job. And, of course, when I was making my Chattanooga Area Brain Injury Association talk, I walk out, my wife and her friends and all of our kids were in the ATV with no seat belts on, so I thought that was perfect. So it's about, it's about prevention, and it, it's about making our kids wear seat belts and booster seats and making sure that they're appropriately restrained because it's amazing how few people who are properly restrained, especially children, have uh, significant injuries. And so... What I want to do is now open up the uh, rest of the time uh, for questions. Um, if there's any topics you want me to go over uh, more in detail, I'd be happy to answer. Um, if you would, Dr. Miller, start with uh, one that I think medical students in particular would be interested in. The, I really like the pictures about the boat. Um, but uh, explain how you use that and then what you would do to intervene based on what, you, what data you get from a bolt. From a bolt, yes. So the, the problem with a bolt is the bolt is just data. It's just the intracranial pressure. And so if the intracranial pressure is high, you have to make one of two decisions, or really three. Um, the first decision would be, do I initiate a different medical therapy? Do I start them on 3%? Do I start them on mannitol, 25 grams, IDQ eight hours, and watch their serum osmolality? Um, do I change their ventilator settings to decrease their CO2, or am I making a surgical decision? And if there is a surgical decision to be made, what is the surgical decision? Is it a decompressive craniectomy? Is it a clot evacuation? Is it an external ventricular drain? And so the first thing is that if you see a change in the data, a change in the intracranial pressure, you want to know why. And so you send the patient down for a stat head CT and see, do they have a clot? Do they have a clot around the bolt? Do they have 
a surgically evacuatable lesion. And so that's why I like external ventricular drains. Um, that's what I typically place. I rarely place a bolt unless um, I just can't get it in the ventricular system. And the reason why I like an external ventricular drain is that you both have diagnostic information, so it gives you data, but then you can also provide a therapy with that external ventricular drain. You can drain off CSF, which decreases the fluid within the brain, which can greatly help with intracranial pressure. And so that's, that's kind of my decision-making metric. Um, most often, I will put bolts or recommend bolts go in patients according to some older literature, especially in older patients with a GCS less than eight. And so if you look at patients with a GCS less than eight, a certain percentage will have intracranial hypertension. And even if their exam is poor, and their CT scan is relatively normal, oftentimes we'll recommend a bolt in this patient if we don't have a great explanation, because some of them can have a occult intracranial hypertension, and that's when I love a bolt, is to answer that question. Well, I think, and I probably should have asked that question first, uh, really was you explained how we use it uh, to make cl clinical decisions medically and surgically, but then who needs one? Uh, and that is based on Exam, yeah. I think that the Glasgow Commons. Yes, sir. Commons sales. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and so the thing about even even if you don't think about the numbers, because if they're if they're intubated, they get one, one point. If they don't open their eyes, well, they only get one point. And so, what's their motor exam? Most of our patients' motor exams, when they have a traumatic brain injury, is they will they'll withdraw. You know. That's, that's the most common motor exam. So that's a patient with a GCS of six. Like that's the vast majority of my notes are a patient who will not open their eyes no matter how hard I try to stimulate them. They're intubated, so they get a point for that. But then they, they, they'll withdraw. And very rarely we see characteristic posturing in someone with a relatively benign looking head CT. And so most of our patients, um, Right when they come in, they're withdrawing. They've been given some paralytic. They've been given some um, sedation. They have reasons why they're not responding appropriately. And so that's the difficult decision is acutely in the trauma bay, does this patient need a bolt? And most often the answer is no. The, the key is to get them up to the intensive care unit, hold their sedation and paralytic, and get an exam. And then if they have, if they have a prolonged depression in their mental status, they have gyral sulcal effacement, so their brain just looks tight. You can't see the fluid-filled spaces on the outer convexity. Those are the patients who I think really benefit from answering that question with a bolt. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Okay, and I guess uh, uh, another question just briefly about the, the carotid injury. Is there a place anymore for surgical treatment, uh, open surgical treatment? at all. Yeah, that'd be a great question for our vascular surgeons, but in, in my mind, um, I think that th that is a, a rare occurrence. We did quite a few carotids uh, as neurosurgeons at UAB. Um, the vascular surgeon, I'll see Dr. Greer here, but um, he would probably be the, the best person to ask. I can't remember, you know, other than, you know, maybe one or two patients. Well, this is a question that our residents in particular could potentially face in a oral exam. Uh, situation with a multi-trauma patient and uh, we did do several open ones years ago uh, prior to endovascular stenting and that sort of thing happening but uh, I haven't seen one treated at least uh, you know an intracranial or at the edge of the skull uh, in, a, in a long time and that's where the majority of the injuries occurred that, that I'm aware of. Bob you want to comment on that? Sure. Uh, great talk, Jody. I appreciate you coming back to us. I think it really is a collaborative effort between uh, neurosurgery and surgical critical care. Uh, you know, these patients need treatment in the ICU and the operating room both, and there has to be a dialogue about how that's going to happen. Um, about the uh, blunt carotid artery injuries, I, in my experience, I haven't seen one operated on in forever. Um, the primary treatment is anticoagulation because the big 
risk is uh, embolizing into the brain. Uh, the occlusions and the pseudoaneurysms, uh, you know, that may be a, an approach for an endovascular technique, but an yeah. open carotid artery repair for a blunt injury is, is uh, I can't remember seeing one. In well, last time we talked about it here and with the <clears throat> vascular surgeons here, it, 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 that is the case. Uh, the last one I remember is operating on was probably 25 years ago. Uh, which again from from history and many of the residents have heard this before our own Dr. Fisher is the was the lead author on the <clears throat> paper in the mm, early 80s on exposure to the internal carotid through uh, anterior dislocation of the, the mandible so that you could actually make an incision and get exposure to it and that is what that is what we did uh, to expose that but those, those the vessel is so small at that point uh, unless you're really lucky and have a larger vessel and can get a good vein graft on it, then it, it doesn't, they tend to occlude. And so the surgical treatment is not very successful. But uh, I think that's pretty much the, the overall opinion at this point. So residents, again, if you were, if you got to that point uh, in a trauma patient on oral boards, I think it would largely be that it would be very uncommon for you to need to do any kind of open repair. The uh, penetrating injuries, that's entirely different. Yeah, that's the difference. Different. I'm talking about blunt injury. I'm yeah. sorry. Yes, just, I just want to make point. that yeah, absolutely no, clear point. for the yeah. residents. And then you get into the discussion right. of do you tie it off or do you fix it, depending on the, yeah. their neurologic exam. Do they have a bad neurologic deficit? You might have to tie it off because you could get this hemorrhagic reperfusion effect or do you fix it? So that's the big debate about penetrating if it's tied off or restore flow. Um, but back to the blunt injuries, um, you know, Memphis is, you know, published as much as anybody on management and workup of blunt carotid injuries. And, you know, their latest series of papers, uh, they have stated that they think that anybody that has a significant mechanism that uh, requires a CT scan of the abdomen uh, should also have, uh, you know, a, a fine cut CTA of the neck looking for occult cerebrovascular injuries and you know here that would be in just a very difficult number of CAT scans to get done and have radiology uh, read all of those. We went to them when we got that those papers and said why don't we just stick to the Denver criteria where Dr. Biffle was when uh, those were first published and we, we use a modified Denver criteria at this point and I think we do a pretty good job of, of catching them. It's the ones that come in that already have their neurologic deficit that are have a, have a devastating uh, result and often are lethal if they have a, a complete occlusion or something like that. Um, so, uh, and I, I, we have uh, experienced uh, in our own uh, community here a uh, SICU nurse was in a chiropractic uh, office uh, not too long ago and sustained a, a blunt carotid dissection presented symptomatic from that. So all kinds of bad things can happen in the chiropractor's offices yeah. we've heard about. Especially if they look like Steven Seagal and they come up behind you. I mean, it's amazing <laughs> just how aggressive some of the chiropractors are. Uh, a question I had for you back about your spine classification scale. Could you uh, uh, maybe talk about the difference between a compression and a burst fracture, yeah. how, how that's determined? Yeah, so uh, typically a burst fracture will violate the posterior wall of the vertebral body. And there are some compression fractures that we call compression fractures just because we don't want to label them burst fractures uh, because burst just sounds like it needs surgery. Um, but the the... The, the, the real definition is, does it violate the posterior wall of the vertebral body? And so for me, that's a burst fracture. If it violates uh, both the anterior and posterior part of the vertebral body. And compression fractures are typically that wedge type deformity that predominantly involves the anterior portion of the vertebral body. Yeah. Dr. Mejia? Yeah. Hey, um, Jody, that was a great talk. A couple of questions. Uh, one is, a uh, you know, we're still using tissue prophylaxis, and when you see the data, it's not really great about that. Yeah. And about 60% of the hospitals in the country don't do it. Right. We still do it. Uh, it's recommended in the Traumatic Brain Foundation guidelines. 
But what are your thoughts on the tissue prophylaxis that we do? I think Keppra is a vitamin. I really do. I, I have yet to see a single patient have a complication related to seven days of Keppra, 500 milligrams twice a day. And so I think that if you look at just kind of risk-benefit analysis of is there a risk of instituting that therapy, I think the risk is incredibly low. Some people will have a little bit of somnolence when they take it, like they'll, but that, that's pretty rare. I mean, Keppra is generally a well-tolerated medication. And so a, an early post-traumatic seizure can be clinically significant. And so I don't think that trauma guidelines are unreasonable, but if you just think over the last, you know, five years, how many post-traumatic seizures have you seen? It's incredibly rare. So that gets into the problem of the instance rate. And so if the instance rate's incredibly low, but then we're prophylacting all these people to prevent a very small number of events, it, it's a hard decision to make. I, what I don't think is I do not think most of these people need to be discharged home on Keppra. I think if they take care in the hospital and they're discharged home and they're to the point where they're cleared for discharge, I think that's perfectly reasonable not to send them home with a prescription for Keppra, even if it's after four days. Because if you think about most of these patients, you know, they'll have like a small amount of frontal traumatic subarachnoid hemorrhage or convexity subarachnoid hemorrhage, so not in particularly epileptogenic locations. And if they look good enough to go home and not rehab, that makes me more comfortable sending them home without Keppra. Now, if they have a clot in their mesial temporal lobe, I probably would keep that patient on Keppra for seven days. And so to navigate those different types of decisions, it's almost easier just to say seven days, stop for everyone. It's easier to have a blanket policy in my mind than kind of pick and choose who and who to use it on and not. Let's take that one step further then. The you know, the junior resident writing the admission orders for the multi, <clears throat> excuse me, trauma patient, who needs it and who doesn't? How, I mean, yeah, so who, who patient, needs to be put on right. prophylactic Tepra? So, a, a, so if I was going to write a sentence to say who needs it, it would be a patient with a supratentorial intraparenchymal or subarachnoid hemorrhage. That's who, or, or, or some center. form of yeah. documented uh, uh, head injury, uh, yeah. mm -hmm. not just everybody with multi right. yeah. Okay. They had a subdural, subarachnoid, or right. okay. in the supratentorial compartment. But not necessarily one that's going to have surgery. Yeah. yeah. Okay. You have a question? Yeah, yeah the, the other question would be is um, about bilateral decompression craniectomies. Um, I mean, I, I see that they're done in some places. Yeah. Uh, some people are very aggressive about that. Um, we always talk about the neuro, to the neurosurgeons here, and you guys don't like to do them. And uh, what do you think about those? Yeah, yeah. I mean, the bilateral decompressive cranies that I did um, were the those Kreiselberg decompressive craniectomies, where you do a, a very large, so you do a bicoronal incision, kind of like a craniofacial incision, take off both sides, and then divide the anterior sinus and then sew in a very patulous graft. And those patients do horribly. And so for me, if someone cannot survive a, a large 12 centimeter, that's the key, is you gotta make it big, unilateral, decompressive craniectomy, they're likely gonna be in a persistent vegetative state if we do make them survive with bilateral craniectomies. And that's why we don't typically do them here is the chance of a meaningful recovery is so low. Now, I will recommend them to patients occasionally, not patients, but their families. I'll recommend patients' families. It's like, hey, we can give, you know, 16, 18, 20-year-old young person a shot by doing a massive bilateral decompressive craniectomy. And, um, and it's typically after they've undergone a unilateral craniectomy. And, and most families, for whatever reason, decline, so. That's my thought. I just have not seen, the, and the data in terms of outcomes for a patient that requires that demonstrates incredibly poor outcomes. That's my. So just uh, a couple of comments about the bolt. Uh, uh, to me, uh, the motor exam, like you said, is the most important thing. And if you're not purposeful, you're not trying to yank your endotracheal tube out or do something like that, then 
to me, you probably have a severe traumatic brain injury, and that's kind of the threshold where you want to start measuring intracranial pressures. And if you're going to put a bolt in, I think uh, there's a couple of caveats. I really think the patients ought to be paralyzed. The last thing that you want is patient try to sit up or start, you know, getting agitated in the middle of a bolt. Uh, that's just going to be uh, bad. And uh, even with a cervical collar on, I think somebody should put their hands underneath the drape and hold the head uh, stable on either side of their ears. So you kind of avoid that head tilting a little bit and the uh, drill bit scabbing off. And depending on what kit you use, there's a couple of different drill bits in there. So you want to make sure you get the 3 8 inch drill bit and not the half or 5 8 inch because then the bolt's not going to fit in the head and you've got to drill another hole. That's always disappointing. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, Dr. Mejia. One thing about the EDV, um, some um, literature indicates that uh, after the ventricle is completely collapsed, it doesn't work. So it's good initially when it's therapeutic, uh, you can drain some uh, fluid from there and get good measures, but uh, some literature will indicate that, um, that once the edema increases and the ventricle, you have from uh, pretty much all the fluid on there, uh, it, it, it not, it's not as good as uh, it should be. Correct. So yeah. That's why I try not to drain them at a, at a pop-off more than 50, or sorry, drain them at a lower pop-off than 15 centimeters of water. Because I think if you over-drain them, then that's 100% accurate. Like if you drop down to zero or five, it just sucks brain into the holes of the external ventricular drain. They quit working. And so I've had much greater success of keeping it at a relatively higher pop-off drainage setting in terms of preventing it from occluding. So I don't know. Do you have a? Do you guys have a protocol for that once you put them in? Because yeah, I, I'd put all of mine at 15. Occasionally I'll put them in at 10 if it's not draining well at 15. Um, but I, I rarely drop it lower than that unless it's in a kid with hydrocephalus, and who's who the compliance of their ventricular systems changed. So that's our standard standard protocol. I mean, the, the really the biggest problem is weaning them is like you have a patient and you have an EVD in and they become somewhat dependent on it over the course of 10 days and then once you go to you know from 10 to 14 days the rate of ventriculitis really goes up and so that's one thing that I've tried to be very diligent about is using those bio patches you know we first saw them with central lines but try to use those with external ventricular drains keep a dressing on it because bacteria love nothing more than spinal fluid you know it's like sugar it's like bloody sugar water and so if any of that's coming around the catheter, then it's going to get infected. And then you have a glucose-rich water solution that's going to get infected. And those patients get incredibly sick. So that's, my, that's, my, that's been my biggest problem here is just trying to get them out. I guess one last question I'll have for all of us, but especially for medical students, and I, I hope I can ask this question well, is that... Uh, Within our specialties, uh, we're used to looking for certain things on both physical, on the history and physical exam. What would be, uh, in your experience, the single uh, most glaring or problematic uh, either history or physical exam problem that we as non-neurosurgeons miss? that you readily pick up on the first time you see the patient. I mean, we all see this in different things, and yeah. abdominal surgery, chest surgery, et cetera. What right. about neurosurgery? Yeah. What, 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 what one, I'll tell you one thing I've been impressed, and I think uh -huh. it's a testament to the, the ship that you run, is the quality of the residents here. It's rare that I go in and find a patient with a blown pupil or with a six nerve palsy. So, you know, kind of, you know, I've, I've said this to numerous people. I think the quality of the residents here is exceptional. Um, and so that's kind of my, you know, kind of applause to you guys. And so, but really it's the pupillary exam. Um, that's the thing that I believe our nursing staff okay. struggles with the most is uh, examining someone's pupils. And, you know, you'll, you'll say, hey, this person has a blown pupil. When you go and look and, you know, it's dark and they're not shining a flashlight in their eye. And so uh, pupil six nerve palsy, six nerve palsies, especially bilateral six nerve palsies are, are indicative of intracranial hypertension. Sometimes those are, are missed. Um, diplopia, like with a fourth nerve palsy, is like if you look at a person with a fourth nerve palsy, it's kind of hard to tell that they have a fourth nerve palsy. Oftentimes they'll kind of turn their head when they're talking to you. 
and that can be a harbinger of intracranial hypertension. Um, so those are the more uh, subtle things, but uh, yeah. Well, that was what I was looking for, just yeah. a couple of common things that yeah, we absolutely. ought to all pay attention yeah, to absolutely. in our exams prior to having to call you. Any other questions or comments? Well, we really appreciate you taking the time to come give us this great talk. We, we need to make this an annual event. Thank you Hey, very thank much. you.